So we were told that we couldn't have children. Mm-hmm. Um, when it was actually not long before we got married, they told us it was both David and I. So um, I'd always... Sub- Sorry, what do you mean? But both of you, like yeah. you said, you mm-hmm. both... So both were- a very strange story there. It's a very strange thing. Oh, wow. <laughs> so strange. Um, so I, I'd always had PCOS. I never had a regular cycle my entire life. Um, sometimes I didn't have one, a period at all, uh, in a year. Um, so, I mean, that was, I'd say, normal for me. I didn't have any real education on that. I mean, I'm 43 now. So back when I was 18 and I was told that I have polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, you probably won't be able to have children. It was a, oh, nobody really knew anything about hormones then. That was that was as, the much, as much information as I got. And they put me on a trial for metformin. It was the first time metformin was ever given. And I took it maybe for like six weeks and I never liked taking tablets. So even then, my parents will tell you, I had a very dramatic panic attack of, I don't want to take this. Oh, I don't. And then from dad never was on the contraceptive pill or anything like that because I didn't want that. Something inside me just said, no, I got to tell you what that was. I just was like, no, it's, it's not right. I don't want to take it. So I didn't. Um, so I just had these symptoms over a long period of time, many years, and dealt with them. Um, the anxiety attacks, everything that comes with PCOS, the, the facial hair that I had, I was just so, so conscious about as a woman. And I was a singer and a performer and an actress on stage. I was just trying to cover my face all the time because I just felt so conscious about it. Um, <clears throat> so I didn't know anything about managing hormones hormones were causing that at all it was just you can't have children you've got something called pcos off you go and that was it what a hard Um, thing to be it was yeah Yeah, it was and then you know i suffered my family are all small my family are tiny petite genetically just made that way and i have always been smaller um you know and active and dancing but but in comparison to my family i was bigger Mm. you know as the one that would get bloated and then, oh, one day I was slim, then I wasn't, then I was But it was just something that I didn't understand and just thought that was normal for someone, that, a young girl. And then fast forward many years, <laughs> I met David. <laughs> and I don't know really what happened other than my periods came. Mm-hmm. I, I fell in love. They released some pheromones and suddenly my barber said, baby daddy is here. <laughs> That's, that's like maybe what that's what it was it was it was just waiting for you to meet the right person but it was <laughs> but mother nature said like i obviously released a, a hormone yeah. when you fall in love you 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 know yeah. you're happy and you release serotonin and oxytocin it's... whatever it was they came mm-hmm. back and i were having them every three months and i went to the doctor and th- it was them that said well you're ovulating um take your ovulation test and see not not that we were trying to get pregnant then it was just for me to monitor what was going on in my body um and then um, i don't quite remember this is going back nearly 10 years now but it was um we did some tests and they suggested that we were tested as a couple if we were planning later on to have a family because actually i think they wanted to put me on some medication for something and they wanted to do some tests to see if if it was all right for me to be on that because i couldn't be on it for a long time so david was like yeah sure i'll do a sperm test I've always wondered what it was. Hand me the cup. I've always wondered. I've been there. Don't worry. Very awkward. He's he's thinking this is where Kaz is going to go too far explaining what happened. (laughs) 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 But he was like, "Yeah, I've always, I've always wondered how many was in there." (laughs) But the sad thing came back. He was like, "They've told me I've got to do it again because it wasn't. I don't know why it wasn't sufficient. You know." It's a little bit of masculine, isn't well, it? It's, yeah, it's it, awful. It is. It's, it, it really is. Yeah. I didn't really know what I was signing up for, I don't think. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. What have I got myself into is is the question that you ask yourself because you're just like, yeah, here's a cup. Yeah. Here's a business. cup. Yeah, off you off go. Off you go. In, like, in this yeah, clinical room and yeah. Yeah, and it was that awkward. was to test though, wasn't it? To see. But it came back. I mean, you did three and they said, mm. but they took us into a room. This is like exactly what happened. The doctor took us both into a room and basically said to us, these words were, you've got more chance of winning the lottery than having a baby, both of you. Wow. Like that was actually what he said to us. 
Wow. And we were both sat there going, pardon? So he said, well, David's, and these were words we didn't understand then. David's morphology and his motility and da 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 you know, it wouldn't even get into your egg and you don't regulate, you, you've not got regular cycles every three months and, you know, uh, IVF could be an option, but save your money. And we were like, ouch. We actually laughed, didn't we? Because we, we did, yeah. We, were, we, we thought... It's a shock, isn't well, it? Well, how yeah. are you supposed so to respond to that? Yeah, like, so... Know? I mean, yeah. before, like, before we got married and things, we'd had a conversation. I mean, your vows were, you know, if it's just us two. And, yeah. Um, so we'd had the conversation that if we if we couldn't, um, you know, we wanted to be together regardless. Yeah. So, but then, you know, fast forward to, to get that news from a it was a heavy conversation to yeah have, like, it, it, it really is yeah. and it delivered that way as well mm. i think is so it can be shocking mm. and cold because it's not it does it's not a small thing for people mm. um well you know if, if you don't mind me saying but you know, it was so for me i i kind of had dealt with a lot of things like that in my mind over the years but david was so new and fresh to be told that actually you won't be able to have children you're not working properly yeah. and there was one night and it was not very far off our wedding he woke up and he was sweating and he was upset and you know he was like i, I can't give you any children like do you still want to marry me like yeah a million percent like it's fine mm. but it was a real it was actually trauma it was a yeah. traumatic thing to have been told mm. and then to respond to um but yeah, so we decided very casually to not make a big deal out of this. We said, you know, we will maybe give ourselves three girls over five years, be very open about doing IVF. Um, we'll give it a go. We'll try. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We're not going to be like, oh, we're doing IVF. We're just going to tell our family, right, we're going to do IVF. We're going to give it a go. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And let's just concentrate on ourselves and be married and, you know, but we decided to start straight away after we got married mm. because we were no, told, about the present. yeah, mm. no, and also, about the present, right? well, this is probably going to take years. And I was 10 years older. We got married when I was, how old was I? 33? Yeah, 33. And let's just start now and see. And uh, if it didn't work first time, yeah. it did. <laughs> I think that's the thing. I mean, we were that what well, for us just being open with it with friends family it made it a uh, less stressful oh, I mean, and the, you really the, suffered with the whole process actually but but the young um, lads in cricket really were quite shocked that you were so open about i've been told i can't have kids mm. and we're gonna have ivf and they're like what mm. it was like it was a real a really empowering moment for you actually to say yeah this is this is the situation and you know it's how it is and this is how we're going forward and that was the first time ever that you were, um, I think, a, a mature man emotionally to all his peers. So, I mean, I was 26 at the time, so yeah. I'm, you know, still baby, relatively young, actually. Yeah. 26 and kind of in like an athlete as well. Probably so it's yeah, those kind of things yeah. that you yeah. don't expect. You just um, you, we do just go through life thinking oh, I'll be all right. Yeah, you just assume right. you're like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I'll buy a house eventually. I'll have kids. Yeah. I'll you know do yeah. do that thing. Um, I wanted to provide the context as well because I'm conscious that Dilly was responding like, oh, yeah, yeah. So Dilly actually was told that he was infertile. I know you won't mind me, me saying. I have like, no fear. You know me. I'm, I'm very open about my personal <laughs> life. It doesn't bother me at yeah. all. But I'm you, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but just so you understand the, the context for Dilly being like, yeah, I, I get it. <laughs> um, so years before we even began dating he was uh told he was infertile mm. and spermia, i think is that is how you pronounce it yeah what? Kind of. it's a doom to do with like the sperm being not lazy sperm but it's just not functioning the way it should be functioning yeah. so yeah. you've got all your chromosomes your x and y but they're yeah. just kind of lazy yeah. basically yeah, yeah. It, was, it was literally it that was what? that was mine as well as not formed properly. Well, we found out actually later and stuff and yeah. Yeah. that David's um, antibodies are so active in healing him that it actually deformed all his all the body of his sperm. Oh, no. So he, I mean, even now, if, if somebody said, oh, you've got an injury, it's, you'll be out for eight weeks, David will be back within three to four weeks. His just body response so really good. works really hard. 
So and are we saying that David's basically like the the version of Wolverine that we just don't know him. about? <laughs> that we he need is. to pull his just blood. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do always say this. I'm like that. You are just an odd guy. Things just. I'm mm. just odd about you in every way and your sperm especially. <laughs> 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 but yeah so, yeah, so yeah, we went through IVF and we had ICSI, ICSI, which is where they actually find uh, the sperm that they want to take and they inject it into the egg. So there are so many things that can go wrong here. Obviously, anybody, oh, I won't go into this, but anybody who knows anything about IVF, there's so many, you know, hurdles you can fall at along the way to be able to get the eggs out for a start. Yeah. Then they've got to produce properly, reproduced and evenly, and then they've got to be graded. And if they're right, you know, they will then choose the sperm if they can get one. And then they inject that in the egg, which can go wrong. It can just die. And then they've got to put that back in you. And then that's got to take. And then it's got to reproduce properly. And then you've got you're pregnant or not. There's so many things that could go wrong. So yeah. all the way through, they're very, you know, let's just, let's see, this might not work, but, you know, Oh, you've only got four eggs, oh, and two have taken ones. Not in. Yeah. There's always a. We were very. This probably won't work. Uh, and it did. <laughs> Must have been quite a shock then when it worked first but, time round. Do you know it was? And he, David was in India at the time, and um, I. So I got pregnant whilst he was in India. <laughs> yeah, you did the whole process when I was away. Yeah, I went, I went through the process on my own. Um, he, he was. Uh, playing in a tournament what tournament was it I can't remember yeah. it might have been the IPL but they say don't take the test to see if you're pregnant because you can get a false positive first but yeah. obviously nobody listens I was <laughs> testing every single day torturous. and I saw the pink line and I was like it's there and then the next day it was a bit darker and a bit darker and then on the actual day it was just there I'm like oh my god uh, I can't tell him he's in India I've got to wait till he comes home and I can remember I FaceTimed him and you were on the treadmill and I had the test and I'm just looking at him and he's saying I'm pregnant. And he's like, you're right, babe. And I'm going, oh, yeah, I'm just missing you. And he's like, don't cry, it's all right. And I'm thinking, oh, I know, I've got this information, but I can't tell you it now while you're on the treadmill in India. So I waited till he came home and we got married at a little church in, um, in Yorkshire. And um, every time he came home, we used to, go up to the church and sit there and have a little chit chat about things on the church step. And a I, pack of Maltesers. We did. We used to have a pack of Maltesers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> and um, um, I'd written him a little card saying, so proud of you on this trip. You've done so well, et cetera, et cetera. And he read it. He was like, oh, thank you. And then he turned it over and he said, P.S., you're going to be a daddy. And uh, yeah, it was. A lovely moment. So that church is really special. We got married there and then we've, you know, we've had a lot of memories there, haven't we? So, yeah, he was crying like a baby. And then, yeah, everything went great with the pregnancy. I found IVF all right, actually. I, I didn't have a really bad experience with it. I weren't one of those women that were up and down, up and down with IVF. I've always been up and down with my hormones, so I think I just navigated it well. I don't know. I didn't feel terrible like I should on it but then at the end of my pregnancy this is the bit that's very unusual and quite rare I started having very very dark thoughts at the end of my pregnancy now my son's now six he's nearly seven he was a very very wanted baby you know we'd prayed for him we'd gone through that to have him I started having uh really intrusive thoughts about my baby in my tummy and even though he's inside my tummy I didn't believe he was mine and I were having these strange thoughts and I knew still whilst pregnant that these weren't thoughts I should be having but I kept them to myself because then the thoughts became oh David won't want to be with me I know these were all unrealistic thoughts you know that I was having um I, I can't really explain the thoughts now, of it, but they were dark. Uh, and then we, I was told Jacob was big, you see. So that was the other thing. They were measuring me saying, your baby's big. And it weren't even a... Uh, I didn't feel like it was kind how they were delivering this information. It was, oh, your baby's big. Oh, you won't be able to deliver him. Two weeks before he was due, they told me he was already 10 pounds. 
and said, you will be able to do this. So we think you should have a elective C-section. And I agreed. Uh, that is one of my regrets now. But that's personally pregnancy and decisions on your birth is so personal. Oh. I decided to do that and I regret that now. But you did the best. I did the, the best time. in that time with the information that I had for myself and my baby. You with know, the information so. that you were given. Yeah. yeah. It's not even had. Just remember that the information you were given. I said this to T. It's what the information you're given, isn't it? Yeah. Because yeah. you're making choices of what you're being told. Yeah. But, I mean, Jacob was born and he was only eight, six. Yeah. He wasn't a huge baby. He was a good size. And I would have been able to do that on my own. And I wish I'd, I wish I'd done that. I wish I'd given him the chance to come out what he wanted because he weren't ready to come out. And I believe that now when things that have happened along the line with my son and my health, my, my baby weren't ready to come. I didn't get that surge of hormone that said, your baby's coming, here's your boy to love. Um, and uh, yeah, he was born and I just didn't know what I felt. I mean, I, your C-section was pretty traumatic. Yeah. Well. That didn't, wasn't straightforward. Really? Um, yeah, it was a it was a rough. We had a rough. I mean, I was having my catheter fit, and the man that was doing it was chatting to David about cricket, and I just remember feeling so I don't know embarrassed, mm -hmm. you know. And then I fainted. I passed out. I was so stressed about things that were in my mind that I passed out just before I went into the theatre. I was on the bed and put the um the cannula in and it had come out and blood was there and then I was trying to tell them that my baby was distressed because I could feel he was he was taking my anxiety I could feel that he was responding to the situation like I was and it hurt and I was like my my baby's distressed and they was like yeah 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 anyway when you're playing for England next mm. <laughs> I was like okay <laughs> um you know yeah anyway Have some decorum it, yeah. it was it was it wasn't nice and that's not, I know people that have had such a lovely, calm, mm -hmm. gentle, magical C-section experiences, but that wasn't mine. Mm. And I just think it added to what happened to me next, which was um, I had my son, who I love with all my heart. But in that moment, I just didn't know what I felt. And that now as a mum... And I've been his mum for nearly seven years. I feel so bad about them feelings because oh, I, my boy needed me. And I was going, hmm. Um, I now know that I had something called purple psychosis. <clears throat> because the thoughts that came after that, I mean, I won't go into the experience that I had at the hospital. But it, it wasn't particularly pleasant. And I think that added to what was already brewing. Um you know, oh, your baby's big. Oh, good job you didn't have to push that out. Like comments like this to a young woman that's just had a baby that I was looking at this baby thinking, I don't know, I didn't want anyone to take any pictures of him, did I? Mm. I didn't, I don't know. It, it, it was such a, it's such a sad time now. And I look back at it, I feel so sad that their moments were stolen. I felt like they were just taken from me. These first minutes of being a brand new mum where I should have been like, my baby boy. I was just like, I, I need to find him a new mum. That was what the thoughts were in my mind. Um, how do I get this baby a new mum? Because I can't. And they were never bad thoughts about Jacob or never wanted to hurt Jacob, or they were nothing like that. They were all about myself. And, uh, yeah, they were. it was horrible. And I would have never have thought I would have had them thoughts or I would have been that girl because I was a strong, independent, you know, I didn't mind any stressful situation. I dealt with that, you know, my background, I was, you know, been in a lot of stressful situations mm. before I would have said, no, that won't happen to me. Mm. And it hit me like a ton of bricks and I couldn't, there were no escape in these thoughts that were coming and they came thick and fast. Did you, did you talk about them together? Like, well, um, so we were sent home after Jacob had been in, um, he was in a little incubator for a while because my blood had got into his body and he's positive and I'm negative and he was quite sick. So we were in the hospital for a week, 
quite a stressful week, to say the least. I've not slept, and you know how it goes. Oh, I can't even imagine. And I'm sat there looking at my baby, having really bad thoughts. Like, and the thought that was going through my mind is, when, when I'm out of here, how do I jump off something really high? Oh my! It makes me so upset to think I had that thought now, because. It, I, I was just, it wasn't that I was tired. It wasn't that I was scared of being a mum. It was just, you need somebody better. There was one moment that just sticks in my mind the whole time because my mum came to stay for a few days when he was born. And I I was in bed and I didn't want to be near him because I believed, this is crazy. This is, I believed I was emitting a poison that if he came near me, he would die. And that's the thoughts that are just so unrealistic you know and it's not real mm. or true in any way and my mum came to the door and she had Jacob in her arms and she just said darling your baby needs you and I said don't bring him in don't bring him in no. and I couldn't explain to her because I'm poisonous mm. I was saying just take him away um I got ticks <laughs> uh I went I dropped weight so fast in like five weeks because I was just shaking all the time and I, I couldn't explain what was happening to me other than I just didn't know how to be a mum to this little boy and he needed a new one. And I, I, if I didn't have David and the man who he is, I wouldn't be here. So I feel like when I hear these stories of women who do something drastic or impulsive my heart breaks because if that would have been me mm. because all I was thinking is how do I skip this feeling how do I skip how do I skip just such an, an out of body experience now and I think back how did I manage to think that thought because now all I can think about is I need to be immortal because I've got to look after my two babies and I need to be the best mum I can be and that is one of the motivations as to where we are with um our health journey now together it's just basically to be best parents we can be to our kids because, you know, it's been a bit of a bumpy ride. And that was just the start of our journey and my health struggles. So the, the psychosis that I had after I had Jacob had to be treated there and then, mm -hmm. you know, and did they did they catch on to, to yeah, that? They or, did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I think what's really what's really interesting what you're saying was, you know, you said a few times like, oh, I just didn't feel like I could be a good mom or, I, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't a good enough mom. And in what everything that you're saying, it's like even when you were struggling with those things that were beyond yourself, because mm -hmm. those are, you know, medical issues. Those are the strength of hormones and all of these different things going on you were still in a way being trying to be the best mum to him mm. because you were trying to stay away because you thought that there was a danger there. So it's amazing that even in those struggles yeah. that you were going through, your instinct was still get him a new naturally to, to try protect. and protect him. Mm. Yeah. Funny. But of course we just give out to ourselves if we say that, yeah. you know, we're wrong. So I just wanted to, to say that because yeah. I just really feel what you're, what you're saying because you do like in those moments you kind of you expect that your experience is going to be this happy beautiful mm. lovely experience that everyone talks about but people don't really prepare you as much or aren't as brave to, no. to talk about the the challenges and i've since spoken privately to the mums mm. who have had similar experiences and i've opened up to them about mine and we have i've seen them relax into a oh mine isn't as bad as yours then and this was normal then and it was one of the things one of the reasons why I, I'm like you know what I'm just going to speak quite openly about my experience because it might help somebody else and you know it, it get them through a period where they're just thinking that they're alone when they're not this mm -hmm. happens it happened to me um but yeah I mean the journey after that it wasn't quite as dark for a long time so I did have some help I had some serious therapy. I was lucky that I could speak to my husband and he went and got that help for me, um, the medical attention, because obviously his wife's telling him that she's going to throw herself down the stairs. 
risky. You need an advocate. I have to ask, David, how did you feel? Because, like, you must have been watching all of this and listening to all of it. But I'm guessing at the same time, having to be a cricketer at the same time, I'm guessing, as well. So it must have had a massive impact on you. Yeah, it it was tough. I mean, it was around that time I almost fell out of love with the game because I felt I I need to be at home here. Like, the cricket's taken me away from place that I need to be but as you know we touched on before we we came live like you're juggling you know if we need to keep a roof over we need to be able to you know carry on with life and the needs of you know life but actually my wife's really really not not very well and it was it was really difficult um I think was it eight weeks old we went to Australia and you know I had a conversation with your dad about what was the best thing to do here whether and I felt really strongly that, you know, it's, get it. I mean, this was November time, and you know what the weather's like at time of year in the UK. It's pretty, we pretty, went to pretty Australia. miserable. So we we went to Australia. We got on a flight. Um, Jacob was eight weeks old, and and we went to Australia and for two, three, two, months. three months, didn't mm-hmm. we? Which in itself was scary. I mean, I was on this plane with eight his baby. Weeks, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But we had to be together, and we were lucky at the time that you were playing for a team. The Perth Scorchers and Justin Langer was the coach there, and he was very, very supportive of our situation. I mean, it could have been very different if it was, um, you know, somebody who didn't really understand family values, but he was, he was very supportive about that. But yeah, that was the best thing that I knew that I couldn't be there on my own. If David left me alone with a small baby, you know, that because that's only eight weeks after giving yeah. birth, and oh, you yeah, just told yeah. us the story, and mm. it's eight weeks. I was on some serious medication as well, so they'd oh, put okay. me on some strong medication for psychosis so i was basically a zombie yeah mm-hmm. i was gonna say because that's going to totally oh, impact yeah you know mm-hmm. and all that of the other bits it has that sort of that's what i'm dealing with now and detoxing from really yeah because you know i've i've suffered from having what i, I think was really needed then i'm not sure what would have happened if i hadn't have had that then mm. um i can't tell you what would have happened if I hadn't taken something that was just getting me through the day because I was I was withering away, you know. I was getting smaller. I wasn't eating. I was my my, my son needed looking after. My husband was playing, you know. Um, so, but that was the best thing that happened to me was going to Australia and just being away from the normal life mm-hmm. around us, and we settled into a a routine in Australia and then we went to New Zealand and then David was on tour with England and we travelled with him. So at the time it was me with a baby strapped to my front and David's playing for England, bless him, and he's trying to play for his country and look after his wife and nobody really knows that I'm sick and it was, you know. We kept it all pretty quiet really, didn't yeah, we, then? Yeah, did. Um, I mean, you get home with a new baby, you don't know what you're doing anyway. Like <laughs> I hadn't even been around... <clears throat> children that much and and especially newborn so I got home and I mean I look back at pictures now of me holding Jacob and I'm like oh my gosh I'm so awkward I, I've got no idea what I'm doing mm-hmm. let alone you know having a wife that's finding things really difficult as well so but this is the thing because even in like you know I don't want to say like a tick box amazing kind of you know perfect healthy pregnancy birth experience because I don't actually believe that there is that out mm-hmm. there um it's at, like it's I, I say it's discombobulating like it literally you don't know what you're doing you're mm. trying to find your feet there's so much going on never mind when you have not only the extra layer of traveling and being abroad and trying to you know kind of focus on your career but then also you know these added struggles that I'm glad to hear that you had some support but it never you know there, there's often okay we'll have this have this drug or you know do this mm. thing and you're fine now but you know by the sounds of things you're not fine and you're trying to balance all these mm. things it's yeah. incredible but that period was the most stressful testing time for us which when we look back now we get sad because we thought that was going to be the magical time we've just got this baby we've been wishing for after IVF being told you can't have children and then actually, um, I didn't know if I could care for him or if I wanted him. Yeah. And that was the, the shock for me and for David. And, you know, our relationship was, if, if we hadn't been solid and I hadn't had the support, or, you know, I don't even 
care to think of what would have happened. But <laughs> there, there is a, a happy side to it. So when we came back home, I'm still um, <laughs> medicated. So I'm, I felt like I, I was seeing life through tracing paper. And that's all, the only thing I can explain. It was like, you know, I'd never taken any antidepressants before or anything like that. This was uh, a new feeling of not really feeling anything, but I were okay. I could go through life and I could do what I needed to do for my son without breaking. So in that sense, the medicine was good mm. for me. Um, and, it, and then, <laughs> then actually, uh, it was it was eight. Jacob was eight months old, and uh, I was going out with the girls. I don't. I didn't really drink anyway, but I was going out and having a night out with the girls after a long time of not socialising and being away. And David had said to me, "Could you do me a favour?" Could you just do a pregnancy test before you go out? Because I just want to make sure. And I was like, what? We were stuck in traffic, weren't we? <laughs> <laughs> and there was a pharmacy where we were stuck. And I was sat there thinking, I recognise this behaviour like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, honestly, <laughs> you wait till we get home. I'm sure she likes me anymore. Like, <laughs> I think you might be pregnant. I was like, 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 what? Yeah. Yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. I think actually I said, I'm not spending £10 on a pregnancy test when we've been told we can't have children. And he's like, just so. go get one. He stopped the car and he went, get out and get one. So I went and got one. And he came back. I was like, ridiculous. What do you mean I'm pregnant? How, why would you think I'm pregnant? And he was like, you're behaving. How you did before. Yeah. Oh, so, like I, I love oh, very, very careful. Yeah. Yeah. One foot out the door of the car, maybe, yeah. just in case you're saying it. When we went home and um, I went into the downstairs loo and before I'd even washed my hands and looked, and it was just boom. Wow. Like, you wow. are pregnant, Kaz. I came out and I was like, oh, yeah. and he was making a coffee or something. He'd be like, you're joking. I was like, ah. He went, don't kid. You know he said you're kid about it. I'm like, I'm not kidding. And I fell on the floor crying, going, I can't do this. I can't do it again. He was like, it works. It works. <laughs> 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 Babe, it works. This is a miracle. And honestly, I remember he was like, babe, we can do this. This is a miracle. This is great. This is great. It's amazing. It's fantastic. Don't cry. Don't cry. And I was just like, oh. but the weirdest thing, and I will always tell this story in such a positive way, because I really, really believe my daughter Maeve, who is the most amazing little girl. She's a diva. She's a handful. But she is, she's like this little ray of sunshine and my experience in her, in the pregnancy with her, completely different. So I came off the medication then because I, I was very much, I mean, I didn't even take a paracetamol when I was pregnant with Jacob. Mm. And I was very conscious about what I put in my body, what I didn't, what supported my pregnancy. And, you know, I was like, right, that's it, I'm coming off. Just came off them. Did, oh, yeah, I was going to ask. So did you titrate down? No. Did you just be like, nah, getting no, off? No, I just you? stopped. What, how did that experience go? I actually, well, this Was is the it? thing that's strange. I didn't really experience anything negative coming off. I don't know no. what happened other than my pregnancy was making me feel good. I'm guessing the progesterone, the pregestational the thing, the hormone, the hormone thing. was supporting me and making me feel calm and okay. That that famous uh, was it relaxing? Relaxing the, the, the Oh, the, that's the muscle relaxing. Yeah, so it, it comes out and just chills you out a little bit as well, doesn't it? The relaxing. No. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna be quiet now. I'm gonna be quiet. I don't know. This is always uh, yeah. he'll, yeah. he'll like make these statements, and I'll come in and be like, no, that's no. not how. It works. But the interesting <laughs> thing in my IVF process, yeah. So when you take in the injections, and then you actually you get the suppository things, so yeah, yeah progesterone. Yeah. They were what I weren't good on. Mm. Yeah, I had a real bad, angry time on the progesterone. Um, things they gave you <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah but um but the rest was fine yeah but yeah my pregnancy so when I was pregnant with Maeve just such a beautiful pregnancy I just felt so fine and lovely and nice and I were I was still <clears throat> I was still reserved I guess with Jacob and life in general like but I was coming back I was coming back I was so adamant I was not having a C-section mm. and I was like this baby will come when she wants to come. I'm going to listen to my body. I know I can do it. Um, Mother Nature has given me this baby. 
I can do this on my own. So I'd, I'd written a real detailed letter to their midwife who when we get to the hospital saying, please, please understand my journey because I didn't have a nice time last time and I want to claim this back. And I just said, you know, you give that. I can't, I won't be able to explain given that I'll probably be in labour. <laughs> so <laughs> can you give them this letter? And, <clears throat> and you know what was so lovely this next time? The midwife had read the letter and when I walked into the room, she just cried and hugged me. Mm -hmm. She was like, don't worry, I've got you. And it made the difference wow. that I had this personal touch that just, she just said, I, I feel you, I see you, I've heard you yeah. and I'm with you. And it just made the difference like I needed. As it happened... I was in labour for four days. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Three and and you are a was better like, woman than myself. <laughs> oh my God. I'm so good. No, I'm, like, I'm not doing it. I'm clenching my seat. It was you know, four days. Why didn't they tell you that it could last this long? I mean, they did not prep me for that. <laughs> but her heart rate was fine. She was just chilled the entire time, weren't she? She's the, like, the, I don't know what you're bothered about, Mum. I'm cosy. <laughs> they'd given me epidurals. Which now I am actually relating to histamine because uh, I've learned so much. There's so much to kind of come back to. But so I'd had three, four three. epidurals. They didn't work. Uh, they didn't work. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they worked for a minute or two. So I was like, oh, I said, I remember going, oh, I can. This is great. I've had I the breathe. epidural. I can, be, I can still feel the contractions. So I know. And they went, you can still feel it. I was like. Yeah, am I not? Am I not supposed to? I went, no. Well, I can still feel it. And then they came back. So as it happened, I was paralysed. I'm <laughs> oh, still going. Oh, oh, geez. <laughs> it was not sexy. <laughs> it was yeah. So it was bad. And then I'd been awake for four days, obviously as well. So you must have been beside yourself. I, I was. I'm so. I'm just like. <laughs> But, 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 but so you see strong. The, you oh. see, it's funny that there's like how much you're you've taken it in such a positive light like i know we we probably conclude on this but can i just say like we've we've only gone halfway through this this conversation and the strength that you two show is just it's it's inspiring it's actually inspiring and so beautiful oh, thank so you. so beautiful like really it's it's making me smile because like it's it, makes me feel stronger about with my relationship with T as well. Yeah. And it's making me feel so appreciative of like the partner that I have and the partnership that you guys have had because that connection that you have is so strong, mm -hmm. which is just incredible. Just I think incredible. what you need sometimes when you go through these, like, let's be honest, just absolutely. Like there's nothing other than like chaotic mm. to describe what, what yes. you're saying. Cause like no one, no one tells you when they're talking about their birth stories and you're going to have a baby. No one's <laughs> like, oh, yeah, you could like be in labor for four days. And yeah. the epidural nobody told me that at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be intense. Intense yeah. is the word, you know? isn't it? It's the intense. crazy thing was, though, even though it hurt so bad, I, I think about that labor and it just makes me feel so happy. And I remember even then going, I'm so thankful I'm in labor that I, I've had that hormone saying your baby's coming. doesn't matter what happens now. My body has put me into labor and my baby is saying, I'm going to come soon, mum. Mm -hmm. And I was just so thankful for that. Mm -hmm. And that is all that I was thinking about right until the end where I was literally just... Like, and the doctor <laughs> took you one, outside, yeah. yeah. Well, I walked down to the midwife desk and I was like, they could see them talking about it because she was, she was spent. She had nothing oh. left. And I was like, look, she needs a C-section here, doesn't she? And they were like, mm, yeah, but she really doesn't want one. I was like, nah, I think it's time. Um, and even that was a com an emergency C-section, a completely different experience oh. to a, an elective. Mm -hmm. Like it was so different. The doctor cheese. came to me, the surgeon, and he lent so close. I felt so bad as well because I'd seen him several weeks before and he was a different one that I'd seen. I was so anxious. I was like, I can't see you. I need, I need the same one. And he was like, okay. And I was a bit mean to him, you know, because I was on the defence. Mm. When he came to me and he just leant next to me, he was like, I'm going to look after you. I'm like, okay. Because I was so frightened. Like, I was so frightened, wasn't I? Mm. <clears throat> About having this C-section. And um, they wheeled me in. And also they'd said to me, well, <laughs> since so you could, could still feel the pain after the epidurals, <clears throat> we're going to give you a nerve bl blocker. If you can feel anything at all when we cut you open, we'll just knock you out. 
okay. Oh, that's not what you want to hear. I'm like, okay, just to top the experience off. So yeah, I was like, promise you need to do. you'll knock me out. Yeah, just promise. <laughs> he was a bit of a chirpy guy, wasn't he? And he just said, do you want the good news or the bad news? I'm like, the good news. He said, so we've started and you didn't feel it. Okay. But what happened then in the next few moments when Maeve was born, I can't explain to you other than it was some, maybe something spiritual that happened. It wasn't medical. It was the only way for me to, for you to get the picture of what happened is when she was born and she was lifted up and he lifted her up to me and showed me. I just felt like someone had lifted a dam up and all the love that I had for Jacob at home and my son, it just all came with it. It just went, and I was like, and I loved her and I loved him. And I'm like, I need to go home. I need to see my son. I need to go to my son. Everything's fine. And honestly, it was like it was mended. That's all, in my mind. I felt that was it. That was, I, I need to go home. And it was like a real feeling. I could feel the touch. I could feel and smell and touch the world again because I couldn't before. And it was different. And she brought with her all the love that I was supposed to have when Jacob was born and that's why she was sent obviously that's what I believe I truly believe she was sent for that to you then, yeah. and the difference was I mean you were you went home that night didn't you it's like are you sure I can go home and sleep and I was like yes yeah, fine I'm fine <laughs> yeah don't worry and he's looking at me like who are you mm. and um so that that was the start of a very different Carolyn mentally again I felt like I was coming back obviously I have um, some anxiety about the trauma, obviously back then, but it's not it's not the real feelings. It's it's from the past feelings. Um, but unfortunately, that was when the physical health struggles happened. 